So, uh, welcome to the second of the eight lectures on Islam and Muslims in Europe and North America. My name is Jonas Otterbeck, which most of you know by, by now. So my, there's actually quite a few people here that will be at a conference or a workshop tomorrow. So I'm, I'm glad to have you all here and recognize a lot of faces from before. Um, and uh, being Jonas Otterbeck, I'm employed by the Aga Khan University, the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, as a professor of Islamic studies here. Um, Islamic studies is a very broad category and, and uh, can contain a lot of different things. Um, not all the speakers will come from Islamic studies or even religious studies, even though Michael Mohammed Knight does. I'll soon introduce him. The first lecture that we had was by Professor Garbi Schmidt, and it addressed the importance of recognizing that the Muslim presence is not necessarily a new one and not as new as presumed when it comes to Europe and North America. Muslims and not least notions of Islam is interwoven in the perception of non-Muslims in all contexts and nation states, and in this case, like Denmark. In Denmark it has developed political ideas and practices in relationship to Muslims and in relation to Islam. She also stressed that Muslims who ended up in Nurbo, which is an area of Copenhagen, which has a long tradition of grassroots politics, that the Muslims who ended up there also took on that kind of grassroots activist politics and took to the streets, just like the population there, the non-Muslim population has done over the years, not least the working class population, but taking to the street to express their frustrations, their protests and claiming space in these manifestations, but also arranging for, let's say, um, Ashura activities, taking the streets at Isnashari Shias, as 12 or Shias. Welcome. As the overall title of these lectures suggests, recognizing is a key word. And the aim is to recognize Islam and Muslims by spotting Islam in a number of different places and acknowledging it, recognizing it for what it is and has become or how it has developed in the past or in the present, or maybe then how it can possibly develop in the future. That means seeing and understanding Islam in all its rich diversity that Muslims have managed to create through writing, speech, physical interaction, socialization, or why not rebellion against convention and through individual creativity and the communication of that. So by taking an impulse from Michael Gilsenen's Recognizing Islam, Religion and Society in the Modern Middle East, this book, it's been around for quite a while. I think the first edition was in the 80s. There's a number of different ones. This one is probably the most uh, ugly one. Um, we aim with this series to develop the core message of the book and to move away from essentialist scholarship of any kind and celebrate what he writes is a cautious awareness of what the term Islam comes to mean in quite different economic, political and social structures and relations. Today, we will hear more about the five presenters, a group whose theological thinking and social patterns is bound to surprise a number of you if you haven't heard or encountered them before. And the one who's going to address that is Michael Mohammed Knight, who works as an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida. He has a PhD in religious studies from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, from 2016, which he just told me is reworking into a book. And it's about to be published this year, possibly, on the prophet's body. Uh, he also has a Master of Theology Studies from uh, Harvard University. And he's one of those who's a really prolific and productive writer and authored a number of different books. And I'm going to mention a few of them, like Magic in Islam from 2016, Muhammad 40 Introductions from 2018, or the book, The Five Percenters, Islam, Hip Hop and the Gods of New York, which is from 2011. Further, he has written articles, among other things, on a number of different things, like the representation of Malcolm X on conversion, mas uh, Muslim masculinities, Islamophobia, 
different kinds of sexualities, and on the curious concept of <coughs> Islamotopia. You can think about what that might mean. Now, some of you might associate his very name, Michael Mohammed Knight, with a cult novel, The Takwa Course, at first was self-published in 2003. Eventually, it was endorsed by the public and printed and has been reprinted several times. You might even know about the movie Takwa Kool. And you might even know that Knight has continued to write novels and published books like Osama Van Halen in 2009. He's also written several works reflecting on his experience as a Muslim in the US, for example, Why I'm a Five Percenter, Tripping with Allah, Islam, Drugs and Writing, and uh, Why I'm a Salafi, all meant to open-heartedly and intellectually address American Islam, but also the relation that American Islam and him as an individual has to the Islamic tradition, different kinds of role models and the convention and the taken for granted issues how can you discuss this open-heartedly intellectually? Since, as noted already, uh, Dr. Knight has earned his laurels as a hard-working academic, keeping the creativity and energy of his other writing and putting it into academic work, which, on a personal note, I truly recognize and sympathize with that we have to struggle trying to avoid becoming the slaves of certain academic forms that at times can stifle our communication. To start with, I'll invite uh, Dr. Knight here, and we'll have a short discussion about the topic and frame it a bit. So give him a hand to start with. And the idea about uh, this conversation is to frame the topic and to give him slightly more free of hands. Than, uh, so let me start with a, a, a question. Oh, welcome. Just after that. <laughs> well, we've been hanging around here, each other now and uh, for two hours, so, but still officially welcome. So, why you started working on the fiber centers? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. What was the fascination? Oh, okay, thank you. So, first, um, yes, we've been hanging out. I officially want to express my gratitude to and who made this happen. Uh, it's I've been overwhelmed just walking around in this building for like the last two hours. This is incredible, and um, really everyone's hospitality has been uh, really touching. Um, in terms of how this journey started, my encounter with the Five Percenters, I came to this song through Malcolm X, so there's a certain history that already connects me to it on some level. And when I was trying to unravel that history or, or investigate that history, uh, I began to think about Master Farad Muhammad, who was the founder of the Nation of Islam, that was Malcolm's initial entry into Islam. It happens to be the, the next uh, slide there. So this is uh, Master Farad Muhammad's mugshot uh, from around 1920. And this was a man of mystery. I mean, we still don't know where he ended up. We still debate where he came from. Uh, he just kind of showed up on the 4th of July in 1930 in Detroit. Uh, preaching, well, he first he just started selling silks mm -hmm. and telling people, these are from your homeland, these are from your people. And he's going around in post-depression Detroit in the poorest sections, um, giving people a glimpse of African civilization that they hadn't seen. I mean, again, this is 1930. Uh, so they would invite him in, even if they didn't buy, any, buy anything, they would listen to his stories, they would invite him to dinner, and he would say, you know, he would eat whatever he was offered, but then he would say, your people don't eat this food, and this is why you get sick. This is why your people live to be 100 years old, 200 years old, um, because they know how to eat in accordance with their natural selves. So this eventually this becomes a, a preaching kind of mission for him. Uh, it becomes a community that gathers around him, and when he disappears, and again, we don't know uh, where he ended up, he is retroactively named Allah by his student Elijah Muhammad. So I was going to get into this a little bit with, with the actual talk to kind of set up the five percenters, but basically the nation of Islam, which is part of my personal genealogy as an American Muslim, and is the way that I found Islam, uh, has a lot of untold stories, or a lot of stories that have been lost, and so it was trying to basically draw a tree of his legacy, of Master Prophet Muhammad's legacy, 
and that led me to the five percent as one of those communities. But it's, I think it's quite important for us to, who might not know that much about the, the American Islamic history to, to acknowledge that the period of the early 20th century was a very creative period when it comes to religion whatsoever. Also Christian groups, for example, developed and, and mystical groups of different kinds and then, well, proto-New Age groups, etc. So it was, it was a fantastic age, actually, for anyone doing religious history. Absolutely, there was a lot of creative activity going on. Um, I mean, there was theosophy, there was new thought, there was all these interesting religious movements going on. Um, and also the trauma and the instability of the Great Migration in which um, countless African Americans fled as refugees from the South on the promise that the North would be better. And this was in many ways an illusory false promise. Um, but this had a, a real dramatic impact on American religion because there were multiple Christianities in the United States and there were multiple black Christianities in the United States. And so um, when many African-American Christians came from the South, they not only um, found religious institutions in the North maybe unwilling to accommodate them or unable to accommodate them, but there were also different styles of religiosity that clashed. Uh, in many ways, uh, black churches of the urban North weren't interested in the spirituality of Southern Christians, uh, it looked, quote unquote, you know, uncivilized in terms of their respectability politics, that these Christians from the South who would get the spirit and they would get taken uh, coming to the North and finding that not to be so welcome. Mm -hmm. So you have a destabilized religious context, you have people starting their own storefront churches, starting their own movements, and this is all going on around the same time that there's also efforts to reconstruct lost histories, reconstruct lost identities. Um, to develop a narrative of what it means to be kind of transhistorically black in a way that transcends the limited narratives offered by a white supremacist America. And quite, a, quite a lot of the early movements were mixing Christian, well, Christian semiotics, Islamic semiotics with uh, African American sort of awareness politics, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the borders, everything is blended before we can even talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, for 40 years, from you know, Farad's disappearance until his own death in 1975. Elijah Muhammad, when he first encountered this man, Master Farad Muhammad, his frame of reference, his window for understanding who this was, was the Bible. So he said, you're the one we've been waiting for. Like, Elijah Muhammad was the, you know, descended from pastors. Right? He was the son or grandson of, of a pastor. So Elijah Muhammad from a very early age knew the Bible inside and out and was impressing his family with his own religiosity and his dedication to scripture. So this man is preaching what he presents as Islam, but Elijah Muhammad's toolbox for understanding that is primarily biblical and, and it stays that way for a long time. And then another question before I sort of uh, give the floor completely to you is that you've been studying this very thoroughly, but not that many people have. So how has that been received? I mean, when you study uh, marginal groups, let's not call it marginal groups, but small groups, uh, generally there can be a resistance from, both from scholarship, but also from, from uh, people in, in the religious group not wanting to be exposed or whatever. So how, how, has, how has this been received by scholars and by, by the five percenters? Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the field, it's very messy uh, as far as the academic study of American Islam goes. Historically, American Islam was not its own specialization. It was something that you kind of do on the side after you do the quote unquote real Islam. <laughs> so you learn eight, Arabic, eight dialects of Arabic, you translate Ghazali or something, and then, and then you do this weird little American Islam thing that's this illegitimate, marginal distance. When you had your children, you can't do travel anymore to write. Right? You, just, you, just, yeah, you just do this, you know, whatever. It's not its own field. It's, um, that, that's the way that it was treated. Uh, so there's a question of who studies American Islam. Is, do we study this as, or, or what, what trains you to do it? Is it a classical, quote-unquote classical Islamic studies training? Because um, this, Ghazali is not going to help you with the nation necessarily. The nation was reading Ghazali, but later on, like in the 60s. Uh, they're reading Ghazali, they're reading Maududi, they're reading Iqbal, they're reading everybody. But there is this question of, does someone who does American religion which is historically the study of white Protestants, 
um, do they come in and study the nature of the song? Or is it someone who primarily does STIC? You know, are they going to come in and, and recognize what's happening here? So there, there's a question of territoriality, who gets to speak for it. Um, in terms of my own story and my own identity, that was also messy. Uh, strangely, you know, I, I kind of think that being Muslim opened doors for me into this community, into accessing this community in ways that it wouldn't if I was black. So there's an intersection of, of my Muslim identity with a kind of white advantage uh, with this community. And part of that, like I'll get into it, the black man's God. So the five percenters don't identify for the most part as Muslims. So if I was a black man and Muslim, what am I submitting to? Right, that would be, that would be the question. Um, but a white Muslim, that's as good as a white guy gets, right? Oh, well, so it's when, I, when I introduced myself as, as Muslim, the response I got oh, was frequently, well, Muslims are our cousins. We're cousins to Muslims. But black Muslims who try to engage the five percenters are met with more resistance, um, in part because um, there are people who are kind of plants on, on, the, on behalf of Farrakhan trying to co-opt the five percenters into the nation that kind of thing. There's, there's a suspicion of black Muslims trying to take away the black man being God from this community. Uh, but that, that wasn't something that I could personally do. So there were doors open for me, I think. Right, so we're looking forward to speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and it might, it might be clear, like this can go in a lot of different directions. So I'm interested primarily in, you know, the, the discussion that follows. Uh, my, my short talk here, because as, as I'll show, there's, you know, there, there's multiple areas that we can go deeper into, uh, depending on, on what's resonating with you. So we start with this pin and kind of jumping off what we were just talking about in terms of the messiness of studying this community, um, this pin throws off a lot of people. I was wearing it quite frequently as I traveled in the, you know, my work with the five percenters uh, and also my work in Islamic studies and people didn't always know what to do with it. Um, at first glance, it's pretty plainly blasphemous. Uh, my personally wearing it opens itself to different readings. <laughs> so. I want to make clear just a few things before I start. The man's name was Allah. That was just his name. So we often, and this is a fight that I've been having with editors, with the field for more than a decade now, you can't call him Clarence 13X. That was not his name. It's offensive to his community. It's, it's saying Malcolm Little. It's saying, it's saying Cassius Clay, if you call him Clarence 13X. He was a member of the Nation of Islam. His name was Clarence 13X. During that time, he dropped that. His name became a law. The New York Times called him a law. The FBI called him a law. The mayor of New York City. If those are authorizing people for you, <laughs> uh, not that they necessarily should be, they all called him a law. All right? So that was his name. That's how he was known. When I say a law, it's not a theological conviction that I'm expressing. I'm just calling him by what he called himself and by what his community and people who knew him called him. Um, we start with him as a member of the Nation of Islam. So he joins this community at the turn of the 60s in Harlem at the mosque that was led by Malcolm X at the time. He is taught that this man, Master Farad Muhammad, who I've touched on briefly here, had very mysterious, obscure origins and obscure final destiny. Like we don't know where he ended up. He was Allah, this man, Farad Muhammad. And Farad Muhammad had an appointed messenger, Elijah Muhammad, who is his privileged student. Now, it's not clear that Farad Muhammad claimed to be Allah publicly during his own career. This is something that happens afterwards. The earliest, earliest texts that we have after his disappearance, they're calling him Prophet Farad. Eventually, Elijah Muhammad establishes himself, you know, against competing factions as the true successor to Farad. And the way he does this is by revealing the secret. The secret was that Farad was Allah and Elijah Muhammad was the only one privileged enough with the insight enough to grasp it. So he says to Farad, he says, 
are you a law? And Farad says, yeah, but don't tell anybody yet. They're not ready. So with this narrative that happens after Farad Muhammad's disappearance, Elijah becomes privileged as the best student, as the true successor, as the closest companion to Farad Muhammad. So at this point, he is Clarence. We're calling him Clarence. Clarence develops, you know, in this community, he's a student of Malcolm X. He's recognizing Elijah Muhammad as the messenger of Allah, Farad Muhammad as Allah. And Allah in this case does not mean incarnation. This is another fight that I'm having with the field. People use the word incarnation. There's nothing to incarnate. Farad Muhammad taught that belief in an unseen, transcendent, abstract God was an illusion used by the devil um, to enslave and oppress. There is no abstract, there, there's no spirit to incarnate. He is Allah. Allah is a man with a body, right? And this is uh, a frequent, you know, pretty obvious point of contention between the Nation of Islam and other Muslims. Uh, it's not as simple as saying, well, the Nation of Islam does it, just doesn't know, quote unquote, real Islam, big quotes on the real Islam. Um, there's actually a member of the Nation of Islam now who has a PhD in Islamic studies. His advisor was Sherman Jackson. His name is Wesley Muhammad. And he actually, his dissertation was about Hadith. And he argues for an anthropomorphic <laughs> reading of the Hadith corpus. He does work on like Ibn Hanbal and people like that. So there's kind of a Nation of Islam Salafism making use of, of or in, engaging this theology through that lens. Clarence is developing, um, you know, within this community. I crop this image because it, it's, it's, you know, a, a difficult image to take in and I don't like showing violent pictures in my presentations, but I want to touch on this briefly because a lot of people get thrown off by the, the white devil thing. Um, Clarence is learning, he's studying the lessons that say that white people are devils. This was the world in which this theology develops. This is the, the lynching of Reuben Stacy in the 1930s in Fort Lauderdale, um, not far from where I live now. Um, white children smiling at hanging bodies, right? Um, mimicking his bound hands. Elijah Muhammad saw this kind of thing as, as a 10 year old. Right, the, the members of the Nation of Islam were primarily, as, as we refer to, you know, with the Great Migration, coming from the rural south into the north, expecting something better and not finding it. But this was the world that they were refugees from, right? If this, this is Satan. I'm comfortable, you know, I, I don't make a ton of theological claims, but I'm, I'm comfortable saying that, that that's satanic, right? So this is, this is the system that Clarence 13X, at the time, Clarence 13X is ingesting, that this is how you explain if, if Allah is all powerful and Allah is just, how does Allah allow oppression in the world? How does Allah allow enslavement in the world? First, it's a radical reconstruction of what it means to be Allah, right? As Minister Farrakhan would explain, you know, in more contemporary material, Allah allowed a nation to be reduced to nothing to show that he can come back and say, be, and make a nation of gods, right? That Allah, Farad Muhammad, can come back to the United States, come back to the wilderness of North America, and say, be, be gods. And he will show his power by rising up gods against these devils. So this is, a, this is the only photo that we have of Clarence in the Nation of Islam, um, standing behind the young man with the newspaper. Um, so Clarence is pretty much a rank and file member of the nation, Mosque number seven, which was a very important flagship mosque uh, under the leadership of Malcolm X. And there's different narratives of how this tutelage in the mosque ends, how his stint in the nation of Islam ends. Um, but the narrative that the community gives us is that Clarence had kind of a Protestant objection to the institution. And by that, I mean, He's studying the Nation of Islam's lessons. He's studying their texts. Their texts say the black man is God. There, there's no mystery God. There's no unseen God that you're supposed to await, you know, a reward in the next life for. Specifically, this man on the right, Farad Muhammad, is Allah. 
This man disappeared 30 years ago, right? Clarence is a member in the 1960s. So Clarence is studying, okay, the black man is God, but that's the law. The black man is a law, the black man is God, and doesn't follow a mystery God, an unseen abstract mystery God, but this man disappeared 30 years ago. So who's my God then? So Clarence comes to the conclusion that he personally is a law. That a law is, again, it's not an incarnation of a spirit. There's no spirit to incarnate. He is the best knower for his time. He is the mortal man at this time who is a law, the one who has mastered the lessons, who has mastered the knowledge. Whether this happens before he's out of the nation, after he's out of the nation, we're not sure. Um, the nation had a very strict behavioral code. Sometimes he was in trouble for violating it. So there is some ambiguity around the origins of the movement. But at any rate, what ends up happening, Clarence is out of the nation, but he has the nation's guarded texts. He has their secret initiatory lessons. And he goes out and he's teaching them to uninitiated, unregistered youths, young men who are not Muslims at mosque number seven. He's sharing the mosques. He's taking the lessons out of the mosque. So when I say it's like kind of a Protestant resistance to the institution, he believes in the tradition. He believes in the lessons. He believes in the, what we would call the scripture of this community, but he doesn't follow the, the structure that is claiming power over it. He has lost his connection with Elijah Muhammad as the representative of this. All right, so on the basis of the truth of the lessons, he's breaking from the institution. He's teaching the guarded lessons to these uninitiated youths, and they call him Allah because he is the best knower. And at this point, 1964, there's no more claims. <coughs> he is Allah. That's his name. This is also around the time that Malcolm X is breaking from the nation. And in February 1965, Malcolm is assassinated. Shortly thereafter, the mosque that Allah came out of, where Malcolm had been minister, is firebombed. Again, there's an incident where you know the details are kind of sketchy. Allah apparently has an assemblage of some of his young followers. They start at the firebombed ruins of mosque number seven. They walk up town to where the Organization of African American Unity and Muslim Mosque Incorporated were in the Hotel Teresa, this is where Malcolm's post-nation organizations were. There's some confrontation with police and Allah is arrested. In court, he says, you can't charge me. You can't put me on trial. I'm a law. The judge is not familiar with the nuances of Nation of Islam theology, doesn't know what it means for someone to say that they're a law, calls it a delusion of grandeur, calls it a sign of mental instability, puts a law in Bellevue Hospital uh, for psychiatric examination. During this time, and this is you know a bit of 5% or folklore, I can't speak to its historicity. Captain Joseph X, who was head of the Nation of Islam's Fruit of Islam, uh, which often gets problematically called its paramilitary unit. Uh, Captain Joseph allegedly says, any young men who have the lessons should come to the mosque, they have to come to the mosque and register as Muslims immediately. So one of, actually the, the guy in the black, uh, his name was Kareem, or his name was Black Messiah at the time. Um, he gets the news, he goes up to Bellevue, and he yells up from the sidewalk, Allah, 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 and Allah comes to the window. And Allah says, what's going on? He says, Captain Joseph says, we all have to be Muslims. And this is the moment where we have a break. Allah says, go tell Captain Joseph that my five percenters are not Muslims and will never be Muslims. Tell Captain Joseph to leave us alone. So Kareem, or Black Messiah, goes back to the mosque, talks to Captain Joseph. Captain Joseph says, okay, tell Clarence, and Black Messiah is like, who? He says, tell, tell Allah that I will pull back the fruit, that we'll leave the five percenters alone. So at this moment, there's, this is why like, I kind of question the historicity of the narrative, um, because it's so useful. Like It's a very useful, compelling way of saying, look, there was a break that the Nation of Islam and this new movement, they 
go their separate ways at this point because Allah specifically says his five percenters are not Muslims and you're not going to register with the mosque. Allah is still held in the hospital. The FBI starts to pick up an interest in them. The local New York media starts to pick up an interest in them and the New York media is saying there's these cells of young black men training each other in martial arts and they came out of the nation of Islam and they're going to kill all the white people and there's this race war developing and they're highly organized in all the projects and they're going to blow up the Statue of Liberty and they're going to kill the Pope and they're funded by Chinese communists. This was all the newspaper <laughs> narrative at the time. It was all over the place. So the FBI gets interested. Eventually Hoover decides that Allah is more of like a, he calls him a local rowdy uh, than you know, a subversive on the level that he was concerned with King and Malcolm. But he says, look, uh, you know, we'll, we'll add him to the security index. In October, November 1965, Allah is found, quote, unable to understand the charges against him. This is six months after being, he's been in the hospital for six months now. Unable to understand the charges against him. And he's sent to Matawan State Hospital for the criminally insane. And what this means is, because he's, he hasn't been convicted of anything. If he was convicted of a crime, you would have a fixed sentence and you have to let him out at some point. He was found mentally unwell. He was found unable to understand the charges against him, which means they could hold him as long as he was deemed unwell. So he's a political prisoner of the New York State mental health structure. Um, he's sent to Matawan State Hospital, which was notorious uh, as just a, a pit of abuse. They used to train police and train prison guards there. And during this time, he's also added to the FBI security index. So the security index, was the list of people that the FBI could take and imprison in the event of a national emergency. So like Martin Luther King was on it, John Lennon was on it, all kinds of people were on it. Um, if there was a nuclear war, Hoover could just come and get these people and just lock them up. So a lot, he's already locked up, but he's put on the security index. He has a kind of breakthrough or a kind of rethinking of the white demonology that he subscribed to. Very similar to Malcolm, and we like to tell this Malcolm story, and people celebrate the Malcolm story, and they perhaps overstate the meaning of the Malcolm story, because I think people want the I hug the devil Malcolm, like they, they like that story. That's, I mean, that's part of how I got my entry into being Muslim at 15, was the last 20 minutes of Malcolm X, right? Um, Allah had his own rethinking of the white devil concept but he did it while staying inside this tradition. He didn't have to become Sunni. He didn't have to go hug the devil in Saudi um, to pick that up, right? He found it within the lesson. So in this abusive hospital slash prison, prison disguised as a hospital, there's a white teenager named John Kennedy who's there for stealing a car. He stole a car and they found him unable to understand the charges. So they put him in Madawan State Hospital. He's horrifically abused, um, and he's, by his own account, he's beaten into a coma, beaten and or drugged into a coma. The story that he tells, and we're getting into some, you know, 5% or hagiography here. The story that he tells, that he told me, he wakes up and Allah is standing over him. And Allah says, you are a righteous man. And this is a direct contradiction against Elijah Muhammad who said that white people could know righteousness but they can't be righteous it's not their nature to be righteous Allah says you are a righteous man and John Kennedy says well you must be God and then Allah says as a matter of fact I'm Allah and I'm going to teach you first he teaches them the lessons the nation of Islam's texts about the white devil he's teaching this to the white devil and he's teaching him his specific codes for unlocking his keys for unlocking the meanings of these lessons, the supreme mathematics and supreme alphabets, which we can talk more about, uh, these alphanumeric kind of sacred algebra systems that he has. So he has a white student in this hell pit of Madawan State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. He's not letting go of the lessons. He's not letting go of the traditions. He's not letting go of the Yaqub history, uh, the Nation of Islam's narrative that white people were engineered by an ancient eugenicist thousands of years ago. He's holding on to that, but what he's taking on is the potential for this devil to clean himself up. Now, the Nation of Islam lessons say the devil can't clean himself up. It would take him too long, 
and many prophets have tried. So Moses was sent to civilize the devil, couldn't do it. And when people ask Allah, what do you mean? Like, you know, how, how can the devil, how can you have this devil student? The lessons say prophets tried and they couldn't. And he said, I'm not a prophet, I'm a law. So, mm -hmm. so he had a white student, he taught him. Eventually he was released uh, in the summer, spring, summer of 67. And he has this kind of makeover with the government. So Mayor John Lindsay in New York at this time is trying to attract leaders who, they're not necessarily elected officials, they're not necessarily church leaders, but they're people who have respect on the streets, who could actually cool down a situation um, if something arose. <clears throat> so he looks to Allah, who was at this time demonized as like the most feared black quote unquote militant in New York. And he says to Allah, he's like, what do you want? You know, do you want, like, like what, what are you interested in? And he says, I want bus rides for the kids to the beach. I want them to go on plane rides. I want them to have movie tickets. And I want a school. So he ends up with his own school. He ends up with all of that. And he ends up with his school, the Law Street Academy. And it's still there today in, in Harlem. So <clears throat> Allah ultimately uh, is the, the emblem. We're, we're going to show some examples of this in popular culture in a minute. Um, Allah is ultimately assassinated in 1969. The movement continues to expand throughout the 70s. And I'm going to breeze through two things here because I want to have time for discussion. Um, but there, there's two major conversations happening around the five percenters. Um, one is their contribution to hip hop, which is um, problematically the primary thing that's often talked about when we talk about the five percenters. And I, I've seen scholars try to write about the five percenters just using music references. Like, like I would write about American Baptists with like, oh, I, I have a Johnny Cash record. I know all about American Baptists. Like I can do that. Um, but people do that with the five percenters in, in problematic ways. But there is this still under-examined archive of hip hop lyrics with five percenter references. So like when the RZA says, ruler zigzag zig law, arm leg, leg, arm head, uh, these are 5% of our concepts. So Allah taught his divinity and ultimately the divinity of his followers because he enabled them to share the name Allah with him through arm, leg, leg, arm, head, pointing to the human form. Uh, when Method Man says, I fear for the 85 that don't get a clue, don't got a clue, um, the 85 are the slaves to mental death and power. All right, so why are they called the 5 percenters? Because they are the 5% who oppose the 10% exploitive priestly class, the rulers, the slave makers of the poor, and their narrative by which they exploit and oppress the 85%. So there's this lengthy, there's this deep archive of lyrical references uh, in hip hop that call upon 5% of material and people just don't get it. When Rakim says it even tells us we are gods in the Holy Quran, um, when he gives a shout to Minister Louis Farrakhan, who has a complex relationship to the 5%, um, some like him, some don't. And when Erica Badu says, uh, I was born underwater with $3 and six dimes, again, we're, we're looking to supreme mathematics. And I, I can break that stuff down uh, if people are interested, but um, 360 is the complete cipher. Three plus six equals nine, which in supreme mathematics means born. So when she says, I was born underwater with $3 and six dimes, three plus six is nine. Um, you may laugh because you did not do your math. You're not keyed into this system. You're not plugged into the 5% culture. And obviously, uh, in the same song, if we were made in his image, then call us by our names. Most intellects do not believe in God, but they fear us just the same. So not only is she asserting a 5% or concept of divinity here, that divinity is material embodied blackness, but there's also a, a gender consequence here. Because when 5%ers teach that the black man is God, there's often a, a gendered implication there. It's, there's a gender exclusion happening. Erica Badu asserts that for herself uh, as well, right? That she's God. Uh, Jay-Z, a couple of years ago, this was a lesson for me in dealing with journalists because when Jay-Z made a lot of, um, got a lot of attention for wearing the flag, and you can barely see he's wearing the flag here. Um, he's wearing the 5% or emblem. And I actually did an interview with the New York Post about it and was very, very careful not to give them anything that they could misuse. But then they referred to like stuff I've written that was less careful um, and just used that instead. So so there's this there's this New York Post article where it says, Michael Knight says the first thing he learned about the five percenters was fuck white people. And 
that wasn't the interview. That was like, you know, I learned along the way um, how not to do this. So uh, I'm God, G is the seventh letter made, all praise is due, I'm ready to chase the Aku back in the caves. So again, you know, there's the system of supreme alphabets, G is the seventh letter made, G in supreme alphabets represents God, right? And Yakub obviously is the father of, of the white devil, right? So Jay-Z, who's not a card carrying official, quote unquote, official five percenter, he's still versed in that culture, he's still versed in that archive of references. And so it's very hard to say like who is and who isn't, you know, a member of the community because it, it doesn't, um, it's not big on institution building and, and formal membership records and that kind of thing. The other conversation, so again, I wanted to provide some openings in terms of where people wanted to go. Um, five percenters historically have been persecuted within prison systems in the United States. Uh, basically in prison religious rubrics where either you're recognized as a religion or you're seen as a security threat group, uh, five percenters have been categorized as a security threat group. Uh, basically everywhere that they've contested it, and I'll say basically there, there could be an exception here, they've won. They fought for religious recognition, the right to assemble, um, the right to wear their emblem, the universal flag that we've seen, uh, and evade, you know, designation or getting points, as they call it in the system, points as a member of a security threat group. So it provokes some theoretical conversations about what constitutes a religion, because um, this is from when I testified as an expert witness in the state of Virginia for two different cases. Uh, one was a Nation of Islam member who was wrongly identified as a five percenter, and the other was a five percenter who was asserting the religious rights of five percenters in the prison. Uh, so the state of Virginia had a religion expert who was their chaplain, and their chaplain said, well, religions have things like God, religions have things like a Bible, religions have things like a church. Basically, the more it looked like his particular Christianity, the more it was a legitimate religion. So we, we took two strategies with that and tried to balance between the two. One was to expose the chaplain's criteria as being essentially, you are a religion if you are Protestant or analogous, if everything's analogous to what a Protestant does. Uh, and second, momentarily play by those rules and say, okay, well, they do have a God, it's them. They are God, right? They, do, they don't have a, a brick and mortar church, but they assemble, they talk to each other, they join with each other and observe being five percenters with each other, right? They have ethics, they have rules, they have whatever you think a religion is supposed to have, they have it in some sense. So the other case um, in which a Nation of Islam member was falsely identified as a five percenter, it was simply saying all these texts that you're busting him for having and saying he's a five percenter, like these are Nation of Islam texts and it, it was bizarre. It was just bizarre that like the same materials in the hands of the Nation of Islam member were okay, but in the hands of a five percenter were contraband. And they didn't realize that they were the same. That's a long story, but, but I'm happy to, to go there uh, if we're interested. Um, the theoretical issue with constructions of religion and, and whether the five percenters fit into it or how they fit into it, not only is it a question of how the state defines religion, and what that means for secularism. If secularism is like a hands-off of religion, but the state has to still say what a religion is. There's also the issue, and the state brought this up, the five percenters deny that they're a religion. And they have newspapers where it says, we are not a religion in bold print on the front page. And the state can hold that up and say, well, why are they suing for recognition as a religion if they are the ones who tell you they're not a religion? And so this took a little bit of you know, theorizing and, and deconstructing. Um, but what it really meant was looking at the five percenters specific definition of religion, like why is the term religion unwelcome for them and why that should have nothing to do with state prison policy. For them, religion means dependence on unseen things, spirit forces. And they say, we, we don't do that. We don't have a mystery God, we don't have mystery angels, we don't have a mystery shaitan, like it's all here in this world in real bodies. So that's why it's not a religion. But there's certain interpretations of Buddhism that would fit that criteria, right? Like there, there's, there's all kinds of groups that you could say don't have this kind of unseen transcendent force that they're dependent on, 
um, but they're still legally protected as religion. So there, there was that question and, and dealing with that when, when the state says, well, why should we call them a religion if they don't call themselves a religion? Right. So returning to the uh, provocation here of Allah um, as a man, a specific man, 1928 to 1969, um, formerly Clarence Jower Smith, formerly Clarence 13X, uh, like I, I tried to give some snapshots of things that can become much longer conversations and, and compress it uh, because what I'm looking forward to is whatever kind of questions you might want to provoke. So, thank you. Well, I can run around. Okay. <laughs> Sitting down all day, and eat the exercise. And you're just stunned. <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Anyone? Thank you very much. I'll be keeping track and, and making some notes. So, Grace, I thank you. Thank you so much, Gordon. Thank you. Really interesting talk. Thank you. Maybe I can just add a personal anecdote about hugging the devil because Martin X. Um, has a very personal impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, when he went to Saudi Arabia, he actually spent time with my father, my grandpa. Wow. He's the one who met, was mentioned in the autobiography. Mm -hmm. And my father came and met him at the airport wow. and he could find somewhere to stay. So my grandpa at that time was the, the Arab League. Mm -hmm. But the only personal thing I'd add to this is they remained friends, very close friends, from 1963 to 64. Mm -hmm. My father used to come to New York and meet him. Mm -hmm. And we have letters from Malcolm X, personal letters, in which wow. he was very clear about the fact that he would be killed very soon. He was convinced he was not going to survive. His argument was that he was going to be, he would have been left to, to live mm -hmm. had he not taken that path towards what he saw as civil orthodox mm -hmm. Islam, mm -hmm. but he was now much more of a threat as a moderate, if that's the word, to mm -hmm. be Muslim than he would have been had he remained with Elijah Muhammad. Hmm. And a very interesting person that despite Lee wanted to see them when he was doing this film, but our family was not interested in wow. showing them at all. Wow. So I just thought we'd really see glimpses of Mark and X's uh, relationship there. I, I, re I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for that. Um, my, my particular reaction to, to narratives about Malcolm is kind of grounded in American Muslim conversations where um, Number one, Malcolm's reinvention is sometimes overstated or the political import of it is, is taken away. So like two weeks after Hajj, he says, I haven't changed. When he's asked, where, where are you with the white folks? He says, I haven't changed. The difference is now I say kill a snake for what it does rather than for, than for being a snake, right? So I think there's a way, number one, American narratives want to soften Dr. King and make Dr. King into something less threatening. And so they try to make Malcolm not into Dr. King, but into their image of Dr. King, right? So they want to just wash away the nation of Islam, Malcolm. And I, I think there's there's issues with that even, you know, in Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm. So like what we often get, so, okay, so there's this Muslim website called Yaqeen uh, in the Yaqeen Institute in the United States, and they just launched a Malcolm X thing. And someone posted on the post about this saying, how dare you use the name Malcolm X? That's offensive. His name was Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz. That's the name that he took before he died. He received the name Malik Shabazz from Elijah Muhammad and used it for a decade before leaving the Nation of Islam. You know what I mean? But, but we, we have this very clear, like, here's the Anawai Malcolm. Here's the Sunni Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz. And that was a Sunni name. And, like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? So, so like, I, I try to, I don't deny that Malcolm had a transformation. I don't deny that he changed. Um, or that his feelings about Elijah changed. But there are consequences to it in American Muslim communities that I, I, I bristle about a little bit. And I try to preserve the NOI Malcolm also. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Thing. Right, please. Yeah. I'm just wondering, with regards to the white man as the devil, mm -hmm. um, I, I really appreciate that photo because I, especially if you're not in American context, you don't understand how much white people are the devil in a way, mm -hmm. from a black perspective. Just like simply, whiteness is, in, 
evil yeah. inherently. So when you think of that narrative that they came up with, that this black scientist creates as a failed uh, an experiment that goes awry, this white people who then go on to enslave them, um, almost like the Jewish uh, idea of the golem, yeah. in a way. But also seems to be very much a critique of modernity that's coming out of out of there too. That science and the very thing that they were trying to create then uses is used against them and used to enslave and, uh, them. I'm wondering how that <coughs> idea plays out in as it gets transferred or transformed into literary or any kind of aesthetic, musical, literary oh. descriptions of white people, not just in the hip hop world more recently, but perhaps if there was such a thing as literature or other forms of art coming out uh, uh, of the, you know, that community in Harlem, the nation of the mm -hmm. community, if, if any, if that has those kinds of repercussions, because obviously now it's so, no one ever wants to talk about white people or the devil kind of thing. It seems like that's just a racist, but there's very good reasons for it, and it's actually not inaccurate in the context of being an African American, mm -hmm. being in the South, or even in the North, for that matter, for mm -hmm. most of the history. Thank you for bringing that up. So, if I can speak to the, the origins of the Yakub narrative, um, because it does often get like ridiculed, and people ask, "Oh, how does someone believe something like that?" Uh, and so, speaking to the social realities and the lived realities and the embodied experiences, you know. It makes sense, and the nation wasn't alone in recognizing something satanic about whiteness, you know, at that time. This was also science at that time. So eugenics was super established, presidentially endorsed, taught in public schools. Uh, the idea that a nation could alter its character by selective breeding, like that was mainstream accepted science. Um, and even as you know, we've mentioned alternative religious currents, the theosophists had their own version of this. So the theosophists were saying, you know, talking about root races and they believe that the Aryans were like the latest and the best. And like, the, you know, there was something better to come, but the Aryans right now are like the, the top ones that they were made around Mecca, where Mecca is. Like it was, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, and in this eugenics literature, when eugenicists try to find like a timeless quality for eugenics, they look to Jacob because there's a story in the Bible of Jacob selecting, like controlling the breeding of, or the genetic traits of his cattle. And he kind of scams his father-in-law um, with his advanced knowledge of genetics. So Jacob becomes the trickster eugenicist in the Bible and that becomes Yaqub. Um, so yeah, so this is all over the place. Amiri Baraka works with it. Um, the nation wasn't alone and not everyone who embraced that discourse ended up becoming a member of the nation, right? So like it kind of flows out and becomes, uh, Yusuf Nuruddin called it uh, urban mythology, right? It was like a mainstream kind of thing, even like if you didn't want to follow Elijah Muhammad and wear a bow tie and, and give up music and, and, and follow his codes and everything, like it was still, um, it was still circulating. And five percenters have different approaches to it because some see it as still very literal empirical history and some see it as a a parable that has lessons in it. Um, you said that um, initially the five percent has read uh, a whole lot of uh, literature, Ghazali and uh, Maududi and Iqbal. But I think Maududi is quite controversial because he identified Islam as a system. So I was wondering if you read more of the classical uh, kind of thinkers in Islamic history, or is it more modern Iqbal and Maududi? Well, I, I wasn't saying the five percenters read them. I was saying the Nation of Islam would yeah, read them. Yeah. So, and this this work hasn't been done, but there's a lot of interesting work that I think could be done, um, particularly if someone accesses like the massive Muhammad Speaks archives. Uh, what I have is the Nation of Islam's bookstore in Harlem. Like I have their catalog from the 1960s. And it's amazing for people who think the Nation of Islam had no connection to like the quote unquote Muslim world. And they were just completely on their own doing this weird marginal stuff by themselves. But like they were selling Ghazali books, they were selling translations of the Quran by South Asian scholars. They were reading Iqbal. Um, they were getting into whatever was accessible in English in terms of international Muslim thought. So what that meant 
you know, I, I can't, you know, go back in time and do an ethnography of Nation of Islam readers in the 60s, but they did leave traces in Muhammad Speaks and things of how they thought of themselves as belonging to a Muslim world. But they definitely thought of themselves in that way. Thank you. Thank you. That was so interesting. I was wondering if we knew a little bit more about the impacts of that very long stay and two mental health institutions. We know it's terrifying and horrific things that happened in those institutions mm. and in those days and it would seem impossible to come out without being radically changed in one way or another and I wondered if there was a kind of before and after. So the narrative and we don't have Allah's own personal account of this mm -hmm. the narrative that I've seen in more than one place is that he had kind of um, like he goes in as a revolutionary and comes out willing to work with the system or he goes in, white man is a devil, comes out, uh, some devils can be good. Um, these are kind of outside interpretations put on him. Like there was, there was a journalist at Amsterdam News, New York Amsterdam News, who um, said that, you know, in his correspondence with the law, that the law suddenly became less about tearing the whole thing down and encouraging five percenters to get vocational training and go to school and that kind of stuff. It, it's hard to say, like I, I do, have the narratives of his white student because he was alive when I came into this community and I spent a lot of time with him. So Allah named him Azrael after the angel of death, said he had the keys to heaven and hell. Um, it, it was his job to get the wrongdoers. And Azrael tells these stories of, they were like 60 beds in a room and there's all kinds of sounds and things happening and this is a horrible, abusive, traumatic place and Allah would pull the sheets over his head and, and Azrael would sing to him. Um, so there, there was some effect, obviously. I mean, he was in there for a long time. Um, we don't know how he felt about it after the fact, how Allah, you know, we, we don't have a ton of him talking about it. Uh, Azrael was, I would say, institutionally disabled for the rest of his life. Like he was always in prisons or hospitals like after that, after being at 16 sent there for stealing a car. Um, he never got over it, like he never healed from that. Um, and, you know, we, we got close and he was always one of those people that like, you go a long time without hearing from him and you don't know, and then you will call randomly and, you know, you can't really kind of keep track of him, but it, it affected him, I know that. I wondered about the uh, security threat issue. That has always puzzled me. That, that, like, why are they singled out in this in, in this particular way? So I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Is there something going on in prison? Or I mean, I've heard stories, but I would like to hear. So there, there's a couple. Thank you. There, there's a couple of angles to that. One is if you're not a religion, you're a gang. Those are the categories you get. And this is why this is partly why they sued for recognition as a religion because they're not a religion or a gang. But you know, being a religion was better than being a gang. Um, what was bizarre to me about that is the Nation of Islam has access, they're a legally protected religion, um, and they had to sue for that also. But they, th their lessons are accessible to them. The same lessons, the state says, oh, you, did you read this? It says they have to kill the devil. Did you read this? It says white people were made wick weak and wicked by an evil scientist. Do you see this? It says black man is God and the world's gonna end. Like this is all like, it's all in this protected material for another community. But when five percenters have it, it's like, oh, you're gonna burn the prison down. Um, five percenters were named in the Senate subcommittee stuff on Attica as being principal, like kind of a bridge because the Nation of Islam didn't like violence and the Black Panthers didn't like religion and the five percenters were seen as kind of like an in-between space there. Um, and there was one person who testified in the Attica stuff that five percenters were behind it in a big way. Um, so they had a reputation. Uh, they grew exponentially in prisons to the point that there were five percenters in prison in the 70s who didn't know that there were five percenters outside prison. Like it was seen as a prison thing. Um, and also like Warathin Muhammad really sold them out. So Warathin Muhammad, who was the son of Elijah Muhammad, brought the nation of Islam into, you know, what we would call orthodox or global or whatever Islam after Elijah died. Warathin Muhammad went to a criminal justice conference convention kind of thing and said, yeah, the five percenters are terrible. We need to suppress them. So Warathin was being the responsible Muslim leader who's going to, you know, be the one who can work with the system and, but like, not these guys, 
These guys are bad. So they had a lot going against them. Uh, the biggest thing for me was that the state would come across these materials and not know that they're also Nation of Islam materials and not know even that Allah changed the lessons to make them less abrasive for white people than the nation did. So like at one point in my testimony, the state said, well, it says in this lesson here, the white man is the skunk of the earth. And I said, well, that's the Nation of Islam version that you allow in prisons. Allah took that out. It's not in the 5% version. So the state was unwilling and, and uninterested and unable to grasp who these people were. That, that's the short answer, I guess. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Um, as well as asking things, if you could speak more about the screen mathematics and um, if you could also go into greater detail about the understanding of gender, um, okay. especially in relation to the black man being God and the black man being earth. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for both those questions. So Supreme Mathematics, um, in addition to the lessons, there was something called the problem book, and it contained basically like, like math equations and word problems for people to, to figure out. And they were basically math exercises, but with an esoteric dimension to them. And the 5 percenter movement reportedly started when Allah and his friend John 37X were trying to science out the problem book. So John 37X comes up with this system in which each number has an attribute. And Allah, who's Clarence at the time, perfects it. He modifies it. So Clarence becomes Allah, and John 37X becomes Shaheed because he witnesses that Clarence is Allah. So Supreme Mathematics, it's basically a system in which each number has an attribute, and you can use these in creative ways to interpret the lessons. The Supreme Alphabet's the same, but with letters. So uh, if the date was the first, if it was the first of the month, you would look at the lessons. One of the lessons says, you know, for the number one question, who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, premier of the planet Earth, father of civilization, God of the universe. So you would take that, number one, work it in with, okay, what's the attribute for the number one? Knowledge. What's the attribute for the letter A, the first letter? Allah. So Allah, the reader, a black man, is saying, I am Allah. I have knowledge of myself. I know who the original man is. So they, they would bring in these things together. Um, if the date was two digits, then you have more possibilities because you could add those two numbers. If it was the 12th, you could say, okay, well, knowledge plus wisdom equals understanding. What's the, what's the third question in the lessons? What's the 12th question? So it becomes <clears throat> infinite the ways you can break down these understandings because it's just mathematical infinity, basically. Uh, so there's a lot of creative improvisational interpretation happening. Uh, in terms of gender, so if I were to say the orthodox, and I don't like using the word orthodox, but the orthodox 5% of position is that the black man is God and the black woman is earth. So the man is analogous to the sun and the earth orbits the sun and, and life happens when the earth processes light from the sun. Um, there are complexities there. So I've known 5% of women who call themselves goddess. I've known 5% of women who call themselves Alat instead of Allah or al Uzza. 5% um, of women who um, take goddess and earth, and they do kind of like an earth goddess spirituality reading of it. So they don't see those as exclusive to each other. And there's precedent that Allah endorsed that. There's, there's an instance where a woman claimed to be God the five percenters took her to Allah and she insisted on it in front of him and he says, she's a goddess. So there's like a, if I was like a five percenter Salafi, I'd be like, okay, there's a Hadith where, you know, Allah gives his okay to it. Um, but yeah, but so, so it's complex and there, there's a quote unquote mainstream position and there's complexities, you know, challenging that. So, thank you. This is an incredibly interesting talk, and uh, I want to thank you for taking the time and giving us the opportunity to listen to it. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, uh, for back of letter, uh, lack of a better phrase, five percent or cosmology, mm -hmm. sort of building on what you just uh, were talking about. In the transition from Clarence 13x, going from Clarence 13x to Allah, 
Was it that he was always Allah and then realized it, or did he become Allah through a process of uh, realization? How did? What's the, the exact process? And if everyone within the Piper Centers are Allah, how do they sort out authority issues? How do they make any kind of decision? within the group? Is it a matter of consensus? Or is there a hierarchy? How does that function? Uh, great question. Thank you. So the Nation of Islam's understanding of Farad is that, as it developed over time, is that Farad trained to be Allah. And this corresponds with like new thought stuff going on about Christ's divinity, not being an incarnationist kind of divinity, but that he was a person who like went to Egyptian mystery schools or whatever and, and learned to be God. So, and then there were discourses using the phrase knowledge of self, like at this time, you know, in the twenties. So that's where the nation of Islam's concept of a human God comes from, because it's not supernatural. It is, you know, in theory, it's grounded in like your human potential. So when Farrakhan says, Allah came and said, be a nation of gods, it's like, you have to be God. You have to like make yourself God. Um, it might be your nature, but you have to like develop that. So I don't have, we don't have access to Allah's personal explanation of how he became that, but that's the framework that he's coming out of, uh, that he wasn't born a supernatural being. He was born a person and then realized his potential, basically. And so that's what he shared with his community when he said, you're Allah, you're the Allah of your own universe. There's no Allah above you. Um, there are disagreements, there are controversies. So there's the gender issue. There's, can women be gods? There's a race issue. Like, what does it mean to be the black man? because it's a pretty expansive definition of blackness. Like one of the main 5% intellect, of intellectuals right now is, is Bengali or Bengali heritage. Um, it's a global, it's a, it's a Malcolm definition of blackness. But can white people become gods also? Because there's different views of that. Um, how, how far can the devil go cleaning himself up? And then our 5% is Muslims because there are five percenters who would say that they are Muslims. I've known five percenters who joined Sufi orders and they go to the Sufi order and they say, yahak, yahak, yahak to each other. And then they go to the law school and it's like, peace, God, peace, God. And it's like all blended together for them. Uh, but these are controversial things because reportedly Allah said they're not Muslims. And these don't all have easy answers and there's not like an official vote and there's not any kind of sovereign over the community at this time. So I think a huge part of it is who controls the school, who's physically, you know, has a proximity to the school because that's kind of the heartland, you know? Um, and then they, they kind of work themselves out the way that decentralized communities do, right? Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the genealogy and the influences of this tradition that we are discussing, <clears throat> um, so, uh, Listening to your talk, it has really evoked and resonated with my own study of uh, Ismaili Shism. Oh. So, and I would like to know if there is any, uh, if uh, in your work you have come across any influences of that, because I know that in North America, uh, medieval Alamut Ismailism was very much influenced in the Beat Generation, Alan Ginsberg, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other authors. And this idea of the divinity of the leader, of the imam, mm -hmm. you know, so it resonates about, and the idea of the imam of one's own being, which are ideas that were very much present in medieval Ismailism, yeah. on the one hand. And it also advocates in terms of wider black culture, I think uh, the idea, of, for example, of Rastafarianism, mm -hmm. and the idea of Jawa Rastafari as being God as well. So if, uh, it would be interesting to know if in your research you have found any of these connections uh, playing a role in shaping uh, this tradition. Thank you. Uh, so I find the connections or, or the resonances or the overlaps very useful, <laughs> not for a genealogy of the nation of Islam, because there's a lot of stuff going on in, in American alternative religiosity that accounts for that more because Farad's not referring explicitly to these materials. So he doesn't have an imam mate. He's not talking about, um, you know, the Athal Bayt or, or anything like that. So it, it's hard to like, we don't have the smoking gun of Farad referencing these things or Elijah for that matter. Uh, but I do think these resonances are very useful for how contemporary people understand themselves in the tradition. So for example, 
you know, different sphere of the tradition. Like I mentioned before, Wesley Muhammad <coughs> studies Hadith, he studies Ibn Hanbal, and he makes the argument that the Nation of Islam's concept of man, God as a man with a body is fully quote unquote orthodox for the first centuries of Islam. And that's a theological argument that he's making. Like Elijah Muhammad doesn't refer to Ibn Hanbal, doesn't refer to Hadith. You know what I mean? Like we don't have proof that that's how Elijah Muhammad saw it, right? Like this is an interpret, this is, if you're a believer in the tradition, this is kind of how you work it out. Similarly, I've seen five percenters make reference to Ismailis. I've seen five percenters make reference to Ibn Arabi. Um, for me personally, as, as a Muslim, uh, I was in Boston taking Shahab Ahmed's Ibn Arabi seminar and also initiated in the, in the Namatullahi Sufi order, which was in Manhattan downtown and going to the five percenter school in Harlem. And that all, that all jumbled up for me. It was all like the same universe for me personally, like not in my work, but like personally, uh, I got it. You know what I mean? So, but that's, that's not me tracing, uh, oh, you know, Farad must have read Ibn Arabi. Like, I don't have that. I can't say that. Um, but how people today understand themselves, because I'm not alone in that experience. So, thank you for that. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the thank very you. interesting talk. Um, what I'm basically wondering is um, about this entire process of uh, transfiguration mm -hmm. or this ascension, as um, I think my question was very much related to my previous two gentlemen as well. Is this idea that, for example, this group or movement was propagating was did they have like an ontological fundamentals of their own, or was it more similar to like the the Greek hero cults, for example, or the 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 process of reserving rights for the king in the Middle Ages, or mm -hmm. were they propagating a, an ontological fundamental of their own? As you said, they were already uh, adhering to the theological uh, principles mm -hmm. uh, from Islam. Were they also adhering to the to, to the philosophical, well, let's say? Oh, and the second part of the question would be because, as you said, uh, this uh, transfiguration of uh, Wallace basically <coughs> towards Clarence. And he claimed it for himself and rejected the idea of Wallace being a love first. So how does the process work of this uh, uh, apotheosis, that is the transfiguration of man towards becoming a divine being? So, so for the first part, in terms of 5% ontology, um, <clears throat> one thing I find, and it's, it's difficult to speak to the original generation, like the, the teenagers who followed him in the 60s. Uh, I think they're primarily in a Nation of Islam universe at that point. But in contemporary 5%er media, it's all over the place. So like there are some who understand their godhood in a Sufi infused way. Like they are systematized, like they're looking for like an Ibn Arabi, Wata Wajud kind of thing. And others are strict materialists and they're, they have like a Marxist critique of religion. And that's what it means to be God to them. Entirely, and, and they both have the same kind of symbol toolbox, they have the same narrative, they have the same resources, but they're on completely different pages, you know, in terms of how they perceive the universe. Um, if I've asked five percenters about consciousness after death or, you know, anything like that, um, there's such a wide range of possibilities because if you're God, you, you name the resources that are useful and the frameworks are useful for understanding that. And so there's incredible diversity. Um, in terms of the, the transfer, can you restate the, the transfiguration yeah. aspect? The, the process of this apotheosis uh, <clears throat> that basically shifted from one man to another. So it's like reserving the divine rights from man, one man to another. As, as, uh, the previous gentleman also asked about this. Uh, I mean, there was an understanding that there's a succession of Allahs. So Farad Muhammad was not an immortal person. Like, he succeeded someone. Like he became Allah because there, there was a need for a new Allah. And so the former Clarence saw himself in that capacity that, well, Farad's gone. I don't know what happened to him. So I guess it's, it's me at this point. Um, should we... Oh, oh did someone else? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Very much for the, uh, interesting talk. I mean, for, for an ignorant person like me, it was, it was so uh, enlightening. Um, I have one practical methodological okay. question mm -hmm. about uh, your, your research whether you rely on any archival materials or any resources, and to what extent these resources are open for other um, 
access or other resources access. Sure. And then the second question it might be a bit of repetition, but I, I because with, when you were talking about uh, uh, some ideas, it occurred to, to my mind straight away of Narabi's uh, uh, the perfect man notion, the notion of perfect man, or the Hallaj uh, notion of the Hirul, mm -hmm. the golden man, or golden man. So uh, to what extent did you touch on this in your research as well? Thank you. Uh, so for the first question, there is a body of 5% of literature, like they have produced their own and published their own accounts of the early history. And so I was able to access that um, by going to their events and getting them straight from the people who produced them. Um, some of that has been kind of floating in the world and can be found. Uh, I had a copy of the lessons that was personally like, like you can, you can Google the lessons and get the lessons, but I had a, but they also vary, like there's slight variations in the wording because these were primarily oral traditions. Uh, but I have a, a, someone's personal copy of the lessons. And yeah, so I was able to access that. Some of it's out there. I would love to, particularly with another community that I'm researching, do a, a digital <coughs> preservation of it because my other project, I'm working on the Nubian Islamic Hebrews and I have 20 years worth of boxes that I'm just the only one who has it. Um, so yeah, and, and in terms of accessing materials, I, I went to the, the New York State Archives for his, for Allah's files. The FBI files are declassified, they're publicly available, but the Matawan State Hospital Archives. So I basically just have knowledge that no one visited him during his time there. I have knowledge of what he walked in the door with and what he was given. Um, but his, but those, those were like the institution files, like who bought something in the commissary, who had a visitor this day, like that wasn't his personal file. So his personal file, there was a kind of a transitional stage where these files were being moved to a place where they would never be unlocked ever because these are people's mental health files, right? Um, and I had a chance, I had a chance to get access to it. The condition would have been, I was like surrendering control of my project to the editorial sovereignty of person giving me this access. And so I decided, sometimes I regret it, because um, I don't know what's in there. You mean that um, you refused to have access to it? I, I had a chance to access his personal mental health file, or a chance to pursue it. It wasn't a guarantee I was going to get it, but I had a chance to pursue it. But I would have had to surrender the whole project as someone's approval, and I, I couldn't do that. So, thank you. All right, we're approaching the end, but we oh. still have two questions. Well, just very quickly, it picks up on what some of the other people were asking, which is, you know, he is Allah. Or what is that? Because different belief systems have different <clears throat> understanding of what God yeah. is and what it means. So the, the normative, you know, um, uh, monotheistic understanding of God, even in the Bible, as most of us know, there is... The El, you know, Elohim, the much older understanding of God, which is far more remote, etc. And then there's Yahweh, which is more of a tribal God, etc. That becomes battery died. Um, then there's Yahweh, which is more of a tribal, you know, God. Mm -hmm. and they all come together in different forms. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering in this case if we're not, you know, we're confusing things by saying, you know, he is Allah, but it's a very different meaning of Allah than the Allah that created the entire universe and is remote there. No, I appreciate that. I missed the second part of your question, but I think they, they overlap somewhat. So I apologize. Um, so to kind of bring these together, uh, personally, I did get into the Ibn al-Arabi stuff and the Wathar al-Wajud and, and thinking about it in terms of that, because I was coming to it with a particular framework, right? Like, what it meant to me personally. Uh, some five percenters are open to that and some aren't because some five percenters saying, hey, this is Sufism. Not, not that I'm saying it's Sufism, but that they would see that as Sufism um, was very helpful in contextualizing their relationship to Islam. Um, there's five percenters who would get into Halaj, you know, and then there's some who say like, we're not seeking union or trying to theorize union with some other thing outside because there's nothing outside. So again, like their concept of Allah, the Abrahamic transcendent creator, like they are not interested, like that does not exist. Um, so 
five percenters are all alternately condemned by their opponents as either doing a haluli kind of thing or atheism and i would say the haluli thing they're they're not they're not incarnations of something they don't believe that there's something to incarnate so it'd be closer at first glance to an atheism but again there are also five percenters who are kind of pantheistic in their in their thinking so if you're god it's up to you that, that that's I mean, I was even told that it's like the way you see it is what it is, right? Because ultimately, it's it's your personal control over your your archive. What goes into your archive? You know, what kind of readings are useful to you for it? Um, you said that I'm not trained in this to be unknown. And uh, can anybody have the same kind of training and then claim to be known? I mean, is there a certain path they have to follow? Well, the second thing you mentioned something about um, self. Uh, 5% of the so where do they derive their, uh, their uh, sources? Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, the first part in terms of training to be God. So the Nation of Islam's narrative is that Master Farad Muhammad was trained by a council of imams, basically, in, in Mecca. That there's a secret council, and this resonates with theosophical kind of narratives of like a, you know, a, a hidden council of ascended masters, right? So Farad Muhammad came to America prepared for his mission by his teachers. Uh, Allah, as far as the former Clarence of the goes, he just kind of did it on his own. He claimed to be Allah, he claimed to be the best knower for his time. But eventually he decentralized that and he dispersed it. He said, every black man is Allah. Uh, there's no Allah above you. You're the Allah of your own universe. So just take it and go. And so now it's, it's normative for 5% of men to name themselves Allah as a surname. So it, it's... You know, and, and the burden of proof, you know, you have to you have to show and prove. So if you're a law, you have to live that out. Right? You have to that's that's your responsibility. If you're a law, how are you demonstrating your power as a law to make change in, in yourself and in the world? So there's there's an ethics to, to being a law. Um, can you repeat the second the so, oh, selfie? Yeah. So that, that's kind of me being kind of facetious. Like <laughs> they, they they don't so so I in talking about the nation of Islam. I describe Wesley Muhammad as kind of a nation of Islam Salafi in the sense that he believes in Elijah Muhammad's authority as a messenger of Allah. He believes that Allah is a man with a body, but his sources for understanding that are the Hadith and the Hadith master. So he makes an argument that Ibn Hanbal was an anthropomorphist who believed that Allah had a body and Allah was a man. So I'm not saying he is a Salafi, but he's making a doorway for encounter between the nation of Islam and people that you think would never encounter the nation of Islam, right? Not that the Salafis are coming to them, but that they're coming to the nation that's coming to the Hadith corpus, right? Um, so similarly, you know, there's five percenters who might be interested in connecting to the origins in some way, right? So I've seen five percenters quote the Quran when um, the Quran tells the prophet, Allah tells the prophet, you know, it wasn't you who threw the dust, like I threw, it wasn't you who threw. Um, that there is this, you know, or if Allah is closer to you in the vein in your neck, like that's that's you. Thank you. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. It was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> a rendering of the five percent of the Alien prejudice. So very big. You, you're being righteous. <laughs> and at heart, so some of them, you're yeah, a teacher. So so you're definitely a righteous teacher. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. So thank you very much. You already had a applause. It could be slightly warmer and louder, I think. So. <laughs>